Ethereum is allegedly moving to the proof of stake chain on September 19th, 2022. Don't hold your breath, but for the sake of this video, let's just pretend that it's going to for realsies happen this time. Now that the merge is being talked about as seriously happening soon, there have been a couple of revelations in recent events that have shed light on just how centralizing the move to proof of stake will be. So if you guys watch the end of the video, I'll be covering what proof of stake means. We'll talk about some of the key players who will get to decide which chain becomes the most valuable chain. And then finally, we'll talk about how very unfortunately the move to proof of stake could build in base layer censorship from the US government to the Ethereum protocol. So go down below and smash the like button for predictable second and third order effects of radically changing consensus mechanisms on hundred billion dollar software projects and let's level up your brains. So what's the deal with proof of stake? Today, Ethereum uses a consensus model that is almost identical to Bitcoin's called proof of work. And if you wanna learn more about proof of work and mining in general, I'll leave a link to a video that I've done in the past up in the cards. But basically lots of computers from all around the world do a bunch of math problems for the privilege of getting to order transactions and the order that scripts execute in in Ethereum. The Ethereum Foundation, the private company behind the creation of Ethereum was basically like, bruh, that's a lot of energy to be using just to order these transactions. Instead, let's allow the people who actually hold ETH the asset to order the transactions themselves. And instead of having everyone buy up all of this hardware and spend all of this energy, we'll just have one big lottery for everyone that holds ETH and locks it up in a process that we're calling staking. How they technically went about doing this and changing from proof of work to proof of stake is really complicated and we're not gonna talk about it. But basically this whole merge situation is just to turn Ethereum from proof of work to proof of stake. It has nothing to do with the fees. It has nothing to do with the efficiency. It's all about changing the consensus mechanism. This obviously pissed the people off who are making a living mining Ethereum because they've invested all of this money in hardware that's about to become much less valuable because it's not spinning off any new Ethereum for them. And so those miners are thinking about forking the Ethereum blockchain. So after the merge, we'll likely have an ETH proof of stake chain called Ethereum, the exact same thing. But then also the miners will fork off and create an Ethereum proof of work network called ETHW or something like that. When a hard fork occurs, a blockchain gets totally duplicated. So if you hold 100 Ethereum, after the fork, you will hold 100 Ethereum and 100 Ethereum proof of work version. When every previous blockchain fork has happened, like the fork in 2017 between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, people got duplicate coins and then the market collectively would decide which coin was more valuable. In the case of Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, everyone dumped their Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin became the real Bitcoin, and Bitcoin Cash is sort of now this like spin off thing that no one uses. But now with Ethereum, there's way more stuff built on top of the Ethereum blockchain than just Ether the token. There's this whole mess of DeFi projects, there's all these NFTs, and most importantly, there are tons of stable coins sitting on top of the ETH network. This means that if you had a board ape on Ethereum, when the fork happens, you will also have a identical board ape on the ETHW network. And most importantly, again, it means that every stable coin on Ethereum would be duplicated onto the Ethereum proof of work network. Obviously, stable coin issuers like USDC's parent company Circle literally can't just duplicate all their USD and move it over to Ethereum proof of work. So Circle has signaled their support that they're not going to be supporting any proof of work alternative to Ethereum and that they're going to go ahead with the Ethereum proof of stake chain. And so have pretty much all of the other DeFi infrastructure players that would be majorly affected in this fork between proof of work and proof of stake. This is a big deal because there are all of these projects that would have to unwind leverage and re-collateralize loans and do all of this complex financial engineering if they're projects got duplicated from Ethereum proof of stake to Ethereum proof of work based on the fact that over here in Ethereum proof of work, USDC and Tether don't exist anymore or exist in a much more limited capacity. If you just rip these stable coins out of the foundation of the DeFi ecosystem, a bunch of is gonna blow up. And so this makes it pretty obvious to everyone that the Ethereum proof of stake chain is going to become the most valuable chain. But this has just shown how much power Circle and these other DeFi infrastructure players have within Ethereum. Vitalik himself has noted that any future Ethereum hard fork will likely be decided by what Circle and other major players in the DeFi ecosystem choose to support. So if there's any little argument in the community, whichever player Circle chooses to back will end up becoming very likely 
really the legitimate chain going forward. So all of this kind of makes sense. And maybe at some point far into the future, Circle and these other DeFi infrastructure providers choose to allocate small amounts of their capital and to get slightly more involved in ETH proof of work if that chain you know, becomes something that lasts far into the future. But it seems like right now, everyone is signaling that they're going to go ETH proof of stake, except for the miners who are moving over to proof of work. So finally, there was relative peace and everyone was pretty much on the same page. But then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. A couple of weeks ago, OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, which is an organization within the US Department of the Treasury, found out about a popular Ethereum privacy mixer called Tornado Cash, which I am not at all endorsing and have never personally used myself, just to be totally clear. But if you guys want to learn more about Tornado Cash and mixers in general, go ahead down in the comments and let me know. And if there's enough interest, I will consider making a video on the topic. Basically, Tornado Cash allowed you to anonymize your Ethereum wallet by mixing your funds with a bunch of other people who are also trying to anonymize their Ethereum wallets and then receiving all of your newly anonymized funds to a new wallet, maybe minus some fee that you paid to participate in the mixing. This privacy feature that Tornado Cash was offering was really important within the Ethereum ecosystem because Ethereum, unlike Bitcoin, is an accounts-based system and not an XPUB-based system. So if I know whatever your Ethereum public address is, I can find out what all Ethereum tokens and subsidiary ERC20 tokens that you're holding, as well as any NFTs that you've transacted and things like stable coins, etc. Tornado Cash was really good for financial privacy within Ethereum, but it was also really good for North Korean hackers to anonymize stolen funds, which OFAC was obviously not a big fan of. So OFAC very calmly and rationally was like, hey guys, if you transact with Tornado Cash anymore and you're a US citizen, you're gonna go to jail for 30 years. So they're pretty chill dudes. They're really fun at parties. Hilarity ensued and people on Twitter started dusting famous people's wallets with 0.1 Ethereum from the Tornado Cash protocol. Basically, Ethereum Twitter was like, oh yeah, OFAC, let's see you throw Jimmy Fallon and Logan Paul in jail if you're gonna be that serious about people using Tornado Cash. So ultimately, we'll see how well enforced stuff like this becomes, but obviously use of Tornado Cash has fallen off a cliff ever since OFAC decided to ban it. And while OFAC can't really tell Ethereum users that live in Switzerland or Japan or China what to do, there is a highly influential group within Ethereum that OFAC has total jurisdiction over. Coinbase, Kraken, Lido Finance, and other large exchanges that are US regulated entities by law have to comply with the rules that OFAC passes down. This isn't a huge deal though, right? Coinbase might be one of the largest holders of Ethereum, but at least they can't order transactions and decide which smart contracts to execute. Oh. F so it turns out that Coinbase, Kraken, Lido Finance, and a few other US regulated entities currently make up 66% of the Ethereum staking on the beacon chain. This means that even if you lived in Switzerland or China or Japan or any other non-US jurisdiction in the world and you wanted to interact with the Ethereum protocol, that you can no longer interact with things that are not OFAC compliant because the majority of stakers in the world are US regulated entities and they legally would not be able to order your transaction on the base layer Ethereum blockchain because of their US regulatory obligation. This would be the equivalent of in Bitcoin, private entities in the United States getting over 51% of the total hash rate and then not allowing certain transactions to specific wallet addresses, which if this happened in Bitcoin proof of work, any other jurisdiction in the world could just build more computers, get more hash rate online, and then drive the US's stake in the network down from 51% to something like 49% or 48%. And this this would happen naturally over time and it would be easier for other jurisdictions to countervail the United States in a situation like this because the hardware degrades over time and everywhere is always putting out newer and better hardware. However, in proof of stake, once a 51% stake is established, it's very, very difficult to ever get rid of that 51% majority staker because they're setting the rules within the protocol. And when they're ordering a majority of transactions, they're also receiving a majority of the fees for all of those transactions and the new Ethereum that is entering the system. So they'll never drop below 51% if they just keep staking their token. Understandably, Ethereum people are freaking out and Bitcoin people are saying, I told you so. I'll include a couple Twitter threads on the topic down below, including conversations from Ethereum devs, threads outlining the topic in general, and likely scenarios that will happen going forward. I personally think that Ethereum will eventually merge to proof of stake. I think the large stakers like Coinbase are going to have to comply with the 
OFAC regulations, and it will just become very, very expensive or impossible to make non-OFAC compliant transactions on Ethereum at the base level of the chain. But new chains will emerge and new tokens will emerge that aren't as regulatory captured as Ethereum is right now. And that will hopefully fulfill some of the privacy aspects that Ethereum, in my opinion, will be unable to provide to people going forward. Ultimately, I think it will be really hard for Ethereum to stay decentralized. And I personally think that it has been decentralized in name only from the very beginning, but we're just finally starting to see evidence of that fact. This doesn't mean that there's no use case for Ethereum or that the price won't go up in the next decade, just that it isn't this magical utopia that it's often made out to be. I still hold a little bit of Ethereum personally, and I think that the regulatory capture could possibly be good for the protocol's adoption going forward, obviously not financial advice. Are you guys excited for the move to proof of stake? And did this video help you at all differentiate what is different between proof of stake and proof of work? Comment down below what you guys think is gonna happen. I do still respond to all the comments. Like the video if you learned something and subscribe for new videos every Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern. I love you all. Goodbye.